when you look at the trails the, of the, the paths the objects trace out, they're pretty complicated. But when you're just looking at it now, and it's actually easier without those arrows, it's actually very easy uh, to look at the motion. You kind of separate it in your mind into two pieces. The, the, the fact that the, the bottom object is moving to the right, that's, and then it's rotating around its center of mass as it moves. It's kind of how you see it. it you rarely visualize that strange trail when you're looking at it. And so it makes sense to think that we could actually divide the kinetic energy of the object into two pieces also. The piece that's associated with the motion of the center of mass of the object from one location to another, and then the additional kinetic energy associated with rotation, or maybe it would even be vibrating around. So motion relative to the center of mass. And that turns out to be true, and it turns out to be a pretty useful thing to do. So that's what we're gonna we're gonna do. Um, so uh, we have another vocabulary word: uh, translation. In the physics and mathematics sense, it doesn't mean going from Spanish to Mongolian, it means mo an object moving its center from one location to another. So it just means moving from one place to another. And so we say that, that And so the the, trans, the, mo the translation translational motion of these things is the motion of the center of mass. Basically, we're talking about the center of mass moving from one place to another. So it turns out we could write the total kinetic energy of an object divided into these two pieces, um, and it's the uh, we're going to call it the translational, and we're not going to write that whole word out, so we're just going to say K trans, the translational kinetic energy. Um, that's the kinetic energy associated with an object moving from one place to another. And the object we were looking at, one of them also had rotational kinetic energy. That's kinetic energy associated with rotation around the center of mass. Now in principle, it could have some other kinds of energy. It could be vibrating too. Um, so, some, so rotational energy uh, sometimes we just say that total kinetic energy, a more general statement, is equal to the translational kinetic energy associated with motion of the center of mass plus kinetic energy associated with motion relative to the center of mass, either spinning around it or vibrating or whatnot. Motion that doesn't of its own accord move the center of mass. Um, and this part, the translational kinetic energy, not very surprisingly, you could imagine following from this, the translational kinetic energy of an object just turns out to be calculated by, you calculate multiplying by half m total times the speed of the center of mass squared, the, the total momentum, magnitude of the total momentum squared over 2m. It just falls out from there. Um, And so the ent so then the core question is how do we calculate this other energy, the energy relative to the center of mass? We could calculate the total kinetic energy of that moving object by taking some instant and finding the velocity of one ball, the velocity of another ball, and using this. But it's not so easy. It's actually much easier to measure the 
velocity of the center of mass and the, the speed at which something's rotating. So, so one of our tasks is actually going to be um, just figuring out how to calculate rotational kinetic energy. Um, okay. So calculating rotational kinetic energy. Now, uh, oh, one further qu one final question before we start calculating rotational kinetic energy. Let's consider the following question. Okay, we decided that the the uh, the bottom object, the one that was rotating, had greater total kinetic energy. Which object in those of those two, the, the top one or the bottom one, the red one or the blue one, which one had the greater translational kinetic energy? Yeah, so that's the thing that was the same, wasn't it? The translational kinetic energy was the same because the total mass was the same. The speed of the center of mass was the same. And what's different is this extra rotational piece that we have to have to add in. So we want to think about how to calculate energy associated with rotation. Now we know if the thing is vibrating, we actually we know how to calculate spring energy, right? And we also know how to calculate just the half mv squared kinetic energy. So that's not the new thing is thinking about rotation. <coughs> So what we want to do is consider an object that's that's just rotating around its center of mass usually. It doesn't have to be rotating around its center of mass, but the calculations just get a lot more complicated. We'll consider the simple cases. So let's just consider a, a cylindrical object, a, a uniform cylinder marker or something, um, or a big flat plate, a disk. Uh, Let's talk about a disk. So, being the simplest case, so it's spinning this way. And so, if we drew a line on the disk and we timed it, um, we would get the period of rotation because the period would be how long the line took to come around once, right? So the period is the time for one revolution. And um, and we define our, our old friend omega here comes back as angular speed in the not it's it's a measure of the rotation in radians per second. So we have Omega is the angular speed. Uh, it's in radians per second. So in one period t, the object goes around 2 pi radians. And so omega is the nice thing about omega, the angular speed, is that it applies to the disk of, as a whole. And that's useful because if you consider different atoms in the disk, if you think about it, you realize they have to be going different speeds. So consider an atom at this location. At this instant, it has a velocity that way. And this atom is some, so we'll call it V1, it's some distance R1 from the center. What's V1? Well, V1, the speed of that atom, it goes a distance 2 pi r1 in t seconds. However, an atom out here has farther to go in the same period. So it's actually got to go faster. So its speed has to be greater. So if it's some distance r2 from the center, we have 
the speed of this guy is 2 pi r2. And since it's tracing out a bigger circle in the same time, it's just plain got to be going faster. So all the different atoms, different distance from the center, they're moving at different speeds. But they're all moving at the same angular speed, which is really nice. And of course, we can express the speed of an atom or a particle at a particular location in terms of the angular speed, because look where omega just falls out here. So that's omega times r1. This is angular speed times r2. So it looks like anytime we want the speed of a particle that's rotating, uh, and we know the, the, the rotation rate, the angular speed, we can just say that the speed is equal to and let's check the units. This is should be meters per second. This is radians per second. That's meters. Radians doesn't count as a unit, so we've got meters per second, so that comes out right. So we have a way of relating instantaneous speed to angular speed. Um, and we're going to do it as a scalar right now. So, okay, so, let's think about rotational kinetic energy, and let's get this equation over where we, omega equals 2 pi over the period, and the speed of some particle distance r from the thing it's rotating around is okay so let's consider a rotating object and think about how we'd calculate its rotational kinetic energy and so let's let's take an object that's a little bit easier to see what's happening than a disk um, so let's make it some sort of No, it's not super general if we only have two odd. Okay, let's make it some sort of weird dumbbell with arms that are two different lengths. It's rotating around its center that way. So the total kinetic energy of this, and it's not trans, it's not translating. Center of mass is at rest. So, um, so the only energy it's got. Translational kinetic energy is zero. The only kinetic energy it's got is this rotational kinetic energy. So how would we calculate it? Well, what we'd probably do is take the mass of object one times its speed and the mass of object two times you know half mv2 squared and and we'd add it up, and that would be right. So we could say that, in this case, k rotation is a half m1 v1 squared plus a half m2 v2 squared plus a half m3 v3 squared plus because um, so translational kinetic energy is zero. <coughs> and, uh, but then we can actually write this in terms of omega, which is the, the angular speed. So we'll just plug in a half m1. So V1 is just omega R1 squared M2. Okay, two more terms. Um, now, there's, so what is R1 and R2? Well, this would be, R1, and that's R2. They're just the distances from the, the object, center of the object to the point of rotation. Um, 
there's a little bit of a, a slightly subtle point about this. Uh, if your object has um, is thicker than the one we saw here, so let's so if we consider a solid cylinder for a minute, which I will try to draw. rotating around this axis, so here there's an axis. So okay, we pick an atom here, this thing is spinning this way, so this distance is R1 and this atom is going that way, so V1 is omega r1. It's also true for an atom down here inside it, the same distance away from this axis. So it's a distance r1 because it's so v, so v here is still omega r1. We're talking, however, about rotation around the center of mass, and the center of mass of this thing is going to be here, and the distance from this to the center of mass is not R1. It's some larger number than R1. So this number we're using here is really the perpendicular part of the distance to the center of mass. That This would be the real distance, but this is we call this R1 perpendicular because it's only the perpendicular component of that distance that really matters. So to be correct, we better put little perpendicular things here. Now in our case, that these these are all perpendicular, it doesn't matter. And it, it just it really kicks in when you have a big object like this and you're really worried about just the distance to the axis here. But to stay honest, we better write those perpendicular thingies. Um but this is a, so we can simplify this expression quite a bit though. We can write this just by doing some algebra is a half. And then notice that omega shows up in each of these terms. So we can just take omega out as a factor. And what's left here is an M1 R1 perpendicular squared plus an M2 R2 perpendicular squared omega squared. And, and that's nice because it's, it's much easier to determine the angular speed of something that's spinning than it is the, sp the speed of every individual atom. And so this thing ends up with a name and it gets lumped into some quantity here. It's called the moment of inertia. A sort of archaic sounding name. Uh, and it's symbolized by the quantity I. So I is defined as for some rotating object m1 r1 perpendicular squared plus m2 r2 perpendicular squared plus moment of inertia. And what are its units? Well, it looks like it's mass times a distance squared, so it looks like it must have units of, of kilogram meters squared. Um, And so we can write the, the rotational kinetic energy now of an object is equal to a half times the moment of inertia times the angular speed squared. And this is this is this this number is going to come back when we talk about angular momentum. Angular moment of inertia is going to come back now. 
it's easy to see what the moment of inertia of some object like this is because you take m1 times r1 squared, okay? The moment of inertia of something like a big cylinder, a solid cylinder, is a little more complicated to calculate because we have lots and lots of atoms that are all different distances. And so um, you're basically going to do that kind of a sum it's easier to do it by setting up an integral to do it, though. So you you divide this into little rings of small thickness. Mind the moment of inertia of each each sort of cylindrical piece, and then add it up. Um, and and that's that can be amusing, but it's sort of not the point. So when we want a moment of inertia of something that's that's not that you can't calculate by inspection. Um, will tell you the answer. There are some examples worked out in the textbook here, so it actually discusses how to get the moment of inertia of um, a thin rod rotating around its center. Um, but we, it's just more for information than anything else. So let's see if we can apply this. Let's see if we can just calculate some moments of inertia and calculate some kinetic energies. So this is a symbolic calculation. Um, so here's our definition of moment of inertia. M1, R1 perpendicular squared, relative. And we're always talking about where are these perpendicular distances are to the center of mass. Okay, so we're always considering something rotating around its center of mass or rotating around an axis that goes through the center of mass. Again, it's possible to do more complicated things, but we're not doing it now. So what's the moment of inertia? Here's a diatomic molecule, kind of a dumbbell thingy. Um, two atoms, they each have mass m. Uh, the bond length is d. What's the moment of inertia of this object around its center of mass? And we're not asking for energy. We're just asking for this moment of inertia thing. How would you calculate it? Okay. Well, so the most popular answer is three, but there's some other popular answers. So we better calculate it, huh? So... It's a matter of actually thinking about what the symbols in the equation mean. So here's, here's our molecule. This is a mass M. This is a mass M. Where's the center of mass in the middle? So here's the center of mass. And so we want distances to the center of mass. So we want, we're going to have moment of inertia is equal to, for this, this contribution is m times that distance squared. What is that distance? Yeah, it's d over 2, isn't it? So we have m times d over 2 squared. For this one, we've got another m times d over 2 squared. So it looks like we've got an md squared over 4 plus an md squared over 4, which should give us an md squared over 2. All right? All right. Okay. Uh, So consider a wheel like a bicycle wheel where it's got a massive rim but very low mass spokes. So basically we're, we're considering it to be something like a hoop. Um, so here's the, here's the wheel, center of mass clearly going to be in the middle, very low mass spokes. Um, 
So what's the moment of inertia of the bicycle wheel if its radius is r and the, the mass of the entire wheel is, is capital M? Well, this, the spokes would contribute some, but not a lot if it's a, if it's a massive rim. So this is not one of these carbon fiber racing rims. This is a, an old, styly, fat bike tire. So the big vote for MR squared. So how did you, how, that's right, how did you think about it? What? So you knew there couldn't be a pi. OK, that's a, that's a process of elimination. So pick a point on the rim and do it that way. That is indeed the basic idea. So here's a way to think about it. It's the mass is distributed around the rim continuously. So that's kind of a problem. But suppose we said, well, let's, approx let's just do this approximately by dividing the rim into four pieces, OK? So we're going to consider four pieces of the rim. And we're going to say, the total mass of this piece is concentrated at the center. So the mass of this would be m over 4, and the mass of this would be m over 4, and we'd have an m over 4 here, and we'd have an m over 4 there. So that's not, that's not very precise, but let's see what it gives us. What we'd get here would be, the moment of inertia would be m over 4 times r squared plus m over 4 times r squared plus so that looks like it would be m r squared. Well, that was kind of an approximation. So let, what if we just divide it into more pieces? That would be a better approximation. So suppose we divide it into eight pieces. So now we've got an m over 8 r squared, but we're going to get the same answer because there are eight of them. What if we divide it into a thousand pieces? Then we'd have a thousand times m over a thousand r squared, which looks like m r squared. What if we divide it into an infinite number of pieces? That's an integral, and we're going to get m r squared, aren't we? So we're saying every piece is the same distance, and so so that was the right that was a good way to think about it. Um, so those are those are things you can do just by looking at them. No one's going to expect you to do the moment of inertia of a, a cylinder by looking at it. We'll we'll tell you what they are. They come out to some some interesting things, but uh, the moment of inertia around and these these things are tabulated uh, when we need them. So there should be. So there's a few given at the end of this chapter. For a cylinder, it happens to end up being a half mr squared. And for a sphere, it's 2 fifths mr squared. And those just come out of doing the geometry. OK, let's actually calculate a rotational kinetic energy. So we have two, uh, a low mass rigid rod with two massive balls on the ends. Uh, each mass is 0.7 kilograms. It's rotating around a pivot at its center with an angular speed of 13 radians per second. What's its rotational kinetic energy? Each ball has a mass of 0.7 kilograms. So one, one ball has a mass of 0.7 kilograms. And the total length of the rod is 0.4 meters. 
Okay. So I think that's right. That's what I got. So um, good. So you had to. So you first you calculated the moment of inertia, and then you. Okay. So questions about that. Questions? Sure. Sure. So we want to use the definition of rotational kinetic energy, so we want to be able to calculate a half I omega squared. Um, we know the angular speed, that's 13 radians per second. So what we need is the moment of inertia of this object. And so we've got two balls rotating around their center of mass. So we add up the contribution from this ball and that ball uh, to the moment of inertia. So let's see, that this is 0.7 kilograms. And this distance, since the total length of the, the rod is 0.4 meters, this distance must be 0.2 meters. So it looks like we get 0.7 kilograms times 0.2 meters squared plus 0.7 kilograms, 0.2 meters squared, and does anybody remember what the, that number came out to? Say again. 0.056. Is that what would you get? Is that what you got? And what are the units here? Kilogram meters squared. And so now we're just going to use that, so we have 0.5 times 0 0.056 kilogram meters squared times, what was it? It was 13 radians per second, so we have 13 radians per second quantity squared. Um, and that makes your answer a lot bigger, so then that comes out to 4.73, is that what it was? And let's see, we have kilogram meters squared per second. That looks like joules, so it really is joules. Okay? Here's an object that's So it's got everything, right? It's got so if we were going to write down the total energy total energy of this object aside from its rest energy, what would we have? We'd have or it's it's we'll just write down its total energy aside from its rest energy. So is it rotating? Yes, so we have a K rotational. Is it translating? And it was vibrating too, wasn't it? So we have both kinetic energy and spring energy associated with the vibration. Yeah. Okay, so the question is if you used, if you just added up a half mv squared for each object, would you capture all those types of energy? You would, but it might be a little complicated. Let's look at, we'll display the, the velocity of each object as it moves. And we, need, we still need the spring energy, right? So we'd, we'd have to, we'd, we definitely would have to include the potential energy stored in the spring. But, but getting the Figuring out what the velocity of each object is, and if, yeah, it's a lot easier to think about it rotating. And, okay, so yes, yes, question. 
Okay, so so the the this k relative thing um, is uh, includes all the kinds of motion relative to the center of mass. So if we just rewrite this so it's easier to group. So this is the piece that's that corresponds to the the motion of the center of mass. We can calculate this because it's a half m total speed of the center of mass squared, right? All this stuff is associated with motion relative to the center of mass, either around the center of mass or back and forth away from the center of mass. So this, this piece is k relative, but if we've got a spring in there, we better worry about the u also. So this is energy, energy relative to the center of mass, associated with motion relative to the center of mass. Other questions?